we need major changes that plant the seeds of health in many uh, settings other than the doctor's office to, to really have this permeate our society and make being healthy the cultural norm. Uh, I would say, I certainly agree, I think we have a disease management system, I would call it, that, doesn't, that is very dysfunctional. And in a nutshell, uh, we are not trying to prevent disease and we are not trying to promote health. We are intervening in established disease, the vast majority of which is lifestyle related and therefore preventable. Uh, secondly, the kinds of interventions that we have come to favor uh, in medicine today are inherently expensive because they're dependent on expensive technology, and I would include pharmaceutical drugs in that category. Um, and just if I could talk about that for a moment. The rate of consumption of prescription drugs in this society has skyrocketed in the time that I've been alive. Um, in the 1950s, when I was growing up, uh, Americans took prescription medication at about 10% of the rate that they do now. I mean, how has this happened that we have, you know, how have we fallen into the habit, and this is on the part of both doctors and patients, that the only legitimate way of treating disease is by giving drugs? And that's very interesting to question that assumption. Uh, that is a huge problem. I would say I have a lot in the book to say about drugs in the pharmaceutical industry. You know, I, I think the, the great majority of drugs on the market are not very good. There are a lot of worthless drugs. There are a lot of dangerous drugs. The percentage that are really good is pretty small. Um, are, the way we regulate these is extremely imperfect. Um, but I would question that whole basic assumption. In fact, there are a whole lot of other strategies for managing disease other than giving drugs, many of which are not only much safer but much more cost effective and ultimately more clinically effective. So I feel very strongly that unless we have a transformation of medicine, uh, any attempt at health care reform is doomed. Now, there has to be a different way of doing medicine. In addition, the larger issues is how do we begin really focusing on disease prevention and health promotion rather than have everything tied up and trying to intervene in established disease. And there, a huge problem is that there are very powerful vested interests who, despite the extreme dysfunctionality of this system of disease management, the healthcare industry generates enormous profits which are going into the pockets of a very few. It's going into the pockets of the executives and managers of pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers of medical devices, and the companies who sell health insurance. That has to change. But those interests have total control over legislation at the moment. And how we're going to change that, that's a tough one. That's going to take a great deal of public anger and realization of the state of things and a demand that we really change the way we do things. In addition, I think in the real challenge, and this comes back to a lot of the conversation today, how can we create a culture of health in this society? How can we make health fashionable? You know, how can we make health sexy? Uh, it, it is. It, I mean, it, 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 it is or should be, but you know, somehow we have not done that. And I think it's the gov individuals, government, and the private sector all have to pull together in the same direction. You can't have the government telling you to eat more fruits and vegetables while it's making sure that fruits and vegetables are the most expensive things you can buy and that the cheap, all the horrible cheap stuff you know, the, is the worst stuff, the worst stuff for your health, and that's done through subsidies through the Department of Agriculture. You can't have that disconnect. Andy, would, would you permit me to sound yeah. a precautionary note yeah. about the, the comment on drugs? As I, as I look out on this audience, I, I don't have much doubt that somebody in the room is taking a prescription medication. I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, you, you've heard it from Dr. Wilde that drugs are bad. I picture, you know, you know Max exodus from the room and everybody flushing their drugs. So I <laughs> no, then it goes into the water supply, which it's now yes. doing. And that's measurable, and we're all getting that right. from that well, source. So, see, you don't want to do that. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I agree, we overutilize drugs. And, and uh, there are some examples of that that are very near and dear to the work that, that I do in my lab, such as you know, we, we have an epidemic of Ritalin use among children. Uh, it seems very odd, doesn't it, that today's children are that much more prone to ADHD than children in previous generations. We can return to that topic. 
But I think there are some legitimate reasons for more drug use. First, we have a lot more drugs available than we did in the 1950s. And some of them are very good, like statin drugs and ACE inhibitors. Also, frankly, it's broken. As we've both acknowledged, we do such a poor job of preventing disease. We have epidemic obesity. We have epidemic diabetes. Now, we don't need to have those epidemics. But unless we do the preventive work, we have a lot of people with diabetes. Well, once you have diabetes, frankly, you really need to take medication. I don't agree diabetes. with that. I think the vast majority of cases of type 2 diabetes can be reversed or controlled if people are conscientious about physical activity and paying attention to diet, however, and also using natural products that restore insulin sensitivity. Well, I, I think there is a minority of people who know, need who, drugs. Who need drugs. Yes. Well, but two two comments. One. Even if, you need, even if you could benefit from the lifestyle intervention, you have to be willing to do it. OK, but that's, that's but, but then it may very well be that we need all those policies and programs. And you know, again, in, in the interim, if most people can't manage to get that job done, the alternative to not taking medication is to have the disease out of control. I, I would just say there, there's a balance to be struck. A lot of medication would be unnecessary if we did all the things that allowed people to be empowered with the pursuit of health. For many people, it's out of reach. And you know, drugs then, it's drugs or nothing. And although there are hazards to drugs, there are hazards associated with failing to treat things like diabetes and coronary atherosclerosis too. We both agree on the preferred approach. I would just be cautious here that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So in, in today's New York Times, there was a, an article talking about the changes in laws to give tax breaks and benefits to employers to encourage prevention and healthful behavior amongst their employees. And there was a debate whether or not the government should be supporting that or, or not. As a, as a CEO of a firm who has employees, and I try to um, model healthy behavior. And I know, Rick, um, having read sort of your journey um, back to health, but maybe you can share sort of how you think about it and how you think about it for your, for your team, your employees, your staff, yourself, your family. Well, I, I think what I, 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 this has been an incredibly fascinating conversation and I'm really glad I've had a front row seat here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're sort of changing gears completely we are, to because, go into this the, kind of thing. But uh, I, I too try to model healthy behavior in front of all of the people that I work with all the time, and as well as my family. And I think it's not just about saying, oh, I don't eat that, and I do eat that, and I do this, and I don't do that, as much as sort of creating um, a, a world in which all of the things that are good for you are also really cool things to do. <laughs> and so we try to, to create in our home as well as in our workplace a way to celebrate food. And we celebrate food as it comes into season. And we put together menus that are super exciting. They're the coolest things that you would all, everyone would want to eat because that particular thing just came into season. When I encourage people to do that in their homes, I always get blank stares like, well, what do you mean for that? And I say, you basically have to create for yourselves your own sort of food holidays. So when the first tomato, to use an obvious example, the first tomato comes into the farmer's market or comes off of the vine in your backyard, that that is the moment at which you celebrate nothing but that, creating a sense of of excitement about the stuff that's really good. I don't think that we have to have a Twinkie holiday. You know, I mean, it's like those are available all of the time. And the, the idea of just doing it, of course, brings up incredible laughter to people because it's an inert thing. And it's not something that you can actually ever have some relationship to. We all know that the things that you can have a relationship to, all of those fruits and vegetables that we always hear people in the nutritional world telling us that we should be eating more of actually have life of their own. Now, they don't always have life of their own in a sort of static way in a lot of grocery stores because we go back to this whole idea of factory farming and, and um, the, the way that certain varieties of fruits and vegetables have been developed over a period of time 
to make them very stable in the grocery store. They're picked green. They're so many of them chilled to a point where most of the life goes out of them. They're shipped to grocery stores. They stay on the grocery store shelves for a really long time, much longer than what something you would buy at the farmer's market would stay there. And suddenly, when people ha start having a relationship with something they think should be very lively, should be very much a part of the energy that they're getting from the fruits and vegetables, the live stuff, they don't feel it. And so I think we do have to actually talk about, when we talk about people having this positive relationship with this really wonderful food, we have to ask the question of how wonderful is that food? And can we actually get back to the really wonderful stuff, the really lively stuff, the stuff that I saw at the first uh, day of our farmer's market when it opened this last week here? That's very different than what I saw at the grocery store last week. So I, I, I would say that we're in, in terms of the way that we're talking now about the healthcare system and the way that it seems to be very broken, and that one of the, the sort of the lifestyle answers to, to real health, we also have to look at the supply side of that. What's going to give us the right supply for a, a great relationship to our food? And I do think that we have to, to look at that as being slightly broken too, and we have to come back to looking at seasonal foods that are raised in closer proximity to where they are eaten. Well, Rick, here's a basic question. Uh, you know, we can have all these wonderful foods becoming available now, but what if people aren't going to make food at home? Uh, Ooh, yeah. You know, this is a big one. Uh, actually, one of the things that may come out of the present economic downturn that's encouraging is that people may start cooking for themselves again right. out of necessity. Uh, some years ago when um, I published a cookbook with Rosie Daly, who was Oprah's chef for a number of years, uh, we went on book tour. And uh, she told me a story that I liked so much that I asked her if she'd let me tell it when we did our appearances. And she said that when she was in Chicago during the time that she worked for Oprah, she had rented a uh, you know, very nice apartment um, in downtown. And when she left after, I think it was six years or so, she couldn't get her deposit back because the kitchen had been used. I mean, I think that, that's, that's amazing, amazing. But you know, to me, this is, this is one of the most significant changes in American eating habits from the time that I was growing up until now, right. is that most people today eat food made by other people. It's made by companies. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not whole food prepared at home. So this is a big question. How do, you, how do we encourage people? First of all, I think food that you make yourself can be much, much better. Mm -hmm. You start with good ingredients, but it can also be much, much better than most of the food that you, not only better for you, but primarily that it tastes better. There, there's, a, there's a really interesting article um, about grocery stores, and in particular they were picking on Trader Joe's, which I'm not sure you guys have here, but yes, they, yes, yes. They, said that, they said that's the grocery store for people who like to think they can cook, but can't. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the questions, and I know David, it comes up with, with uh, childhood obesity and childhood health issues, is getting families back to cooking together. Right. Part of the question I ask for all of you is what can you do to kick off family cooking again? What are the things that uh, would encourage that to happen, especially if people are saying, well, I, I don't know where to start. People think it's too hard, they don't have time, they don't know how to do it. But before we get into family cooking, and Rick will probably be the expert here on culinary advice, a couple of comments. First of all, Andy, it, it, you, know, you kind of just shifted gears. We're talking about the power of lifestyle to prevent disease, but we, we would both agree the cornerstones of that healthy lifestyle, assuming you're avoiding toxic substances or eating well, being active, people aren't even preparing their food. We have a pretty steep mountain to climb before we can say we will get from lifestyle what we could get to prevent disease. Hence, we use too many drugs. I think before we talk about getting families cooking, we need to talk about getting families center place in discussions about health. Uh, you know, as a preventive medicine expert, when I'm called on to speak, usually it's to professional audiences, and almost invariably, it's either about the general health of adults, talk about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or very often my commission specifically is come address the epidemic of childhood obesity. I, I just spoke in Michigan uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I was supposed to address worksite wellness. 
I was invited to speak by AARP. I was supposed to talk about the health of the baby boomers and, and their clientele. And frankly, every time I'm asked to do that, I, I defy the request and say, the basic functional unit of our society is the family. How many of you live with somebody else, you know, a household with more than one person? So certainly a majority in this room, and how many of you are members of a family? Right. You all are. Uh, how many of you are too damn lazy to put your arms in the air? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the basic functional unit of our, of, of, in our society is the family, and yet there's very little that looks at building skill power for health there. Let's have a worksite wellness program and a corresponding program in school so that the kids and the parents are getting the same message and will reinforce it. Let's teach them both how to cook so that when one doesn't feel like doing it, maybe the other can chip in. So, you know, I'll pass the, the family cooking issue on to you, Rick, but I think we, we do a disservice in talking about health in forgetting the, the very good advice from John Donne some centuries ago, no man, no person is an island entire of itself. We're all a part of something bigger than ourselves, and frankly, to, to add to the willpower for good health, the skill power, which encompasses many things, but certainly some skills in, in kitchens you're actually allowed to use would count among them, uh, frankly, I think a team will get the job done where an individual might not. You know, interestingly, um, a couple of weeks ago I was with uh, Alice Waters and others talking about the environment, but food came into it very quickly. And one of the things we were all talking about is uh, community cooking. Um, is there a way, if we can't learn it by ourselves in our, with our little hot plate, is there a way to bring people together in a different way to think about it? And, can the farmers markets or other places be the be the igniters from that? Um, Rick, in, before you send Terry, you, you were referring to the New York Times article, and you did a masterful job, Rick, of giving a superb answer. Maybe not to that particular question, but it was all it was all great stuff. But this piece in the New York Times was specifically financial incentives and disincentives for employees pursuing health, and Congress is is currently taking up the mandate. I'd like to think, you know, there, there may be creative ways to make learning how to cook part of that. So, for example, you have a group of employees and maybe there's a financial incentive to support a lunch group where they take turns bringing in a healthy recipe. Uh, everybody gets to experience everybody else's culinary efforts. Everybody increases their repertoire learning from one another. I don't know if there are examples of something like that. Well, I, I don't know of any examples specifically of that, but those things that sort of just jump up automatically amongst people that like food and start sharing things are clearly, like they have done you know, for generations and generations. Our biggest problem is that right now we are so far down the road of people not cooking that nobody has those basic skills right. that they used to yep. have. Yeah. Like yeah. when I was a kid, yeah. everybody knew how to cook all the basic stuff. It was just the, the skill set, or at least the knowledge set, that everyone was equipped with. Nowadays, because we're so many generations from that, starting cooking, teaching people about cooking, is like starting completely from scratch. Foreign language. Yeah. It's a complete foreign yeah. language. And so people do say, as Andy said, that they have no time and that they don't know how to do that, and, and that it's, it's too, hard. Too, hard. too hard. Well, it's only too hard because they've never done it before. Right. Anything you've done a few times becomes less difficult, and it becomes less time consuming as well. So it really comes down to the fact that they don't know how. And that a little bit of help with getting people down the path, I, I am amazed sometimes when I do cooking demonstrations, and I'll choose to do something that is so utterly simple. Yeah, You know, exactly. three or four exactly. ingredients, right. one or two steps, exactly. and you've got something really tasty that people get so incredibly animated, yep. way more animated than if I make a yep. dish that takes an hour and a half right. and has all these different parts and steps, which, you know, from, from a, uh, the standpoint of a of chef, you know, I'm really proud. I've got, I'm going to show you my craft. You know, I want to put it all out there in front of you. But the thing that I have gone back to more than anything these days is the three or four ingredients. Now, what steps. also, the other step, and this is what most people will not believe, is that food made that way, that very simple, very easy, and very tasty, can also be food that's very good for you. 
It uh, usually is. Yes, but <laughs> people don't believe that because no. in this culture, uh, most people think there is an opposition between food that's good and food that's good for you. Yeah. And it, you know, most of us have had the experience of being served absolutely dreadful food that's been called health food. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. No. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, you know, and this is, this is such a pervasive uh, way of thinking. I watched a, some of you may have seen the, there was a, a, uh, a PBS series uh, with Julia Child and Jacques Pepin uh, cooking together. And there was one episode I remember where, you know, they, they got into some little tiffs and uh, they're cooking something. I don't remember it was. He, some, something with peas, and Jacques Pepin says something to her, you know, that they're doing something, and he says, and she, he says, it's much more nutritious this way also. And she very indignantly replies, we're not interested in nutrition here. We're only interested in flavor. Why can't you be interested in both? You know, why, why does this have to be different? Uh, you know, there is no, when I, the food that I cook, which tends to be very easy, quick, and I think delicious, you know, I serve to people as delicious food. I don't advertise it as being healthy food. It, it happens to conform to principles of good nutrition. But I think you don't believe that unless you've had the experience of eating such food. I'm sure we all agree, and, and probably many members of this audience, that it's absolutely possible to love food that loves you back. And you know, if you think about our relationship with food, it is about pleasure and that shouldn't go away. But you know, we all get pleasure from a really great meal. We also get pleasure from feeling really great and you don't want to trade one against the other. And part of the problem is people don't have the skill set. And, and again, I, I would say that a crucial issue in the pursuit of health is to append to willpower, because we do need to have will, and this gets back to that issue of personal responsibility, skill power. It's all well and good to say we're responsible for owning our own health. If we don't have the skill set that allows us to get there from here, we have will but no way, and that's very frustrating. I read that the average Italian man at age 18 knows how to make a basic tomato sauce mm -hmm. and a few other dishes. And, and I was in Italy last November. I was in uh, Tuscany and uh, Piedmont, and uh, just amazed at the different culture of food there. You know, you stop at the rest stops on the Autostrada, and the food is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I mean, wonderful salad and, and bar homemade. and homemade. Right, absolutely. I mean, amazing. It, the, the, right. Then the, the other—that's a different cultural the, value uh, placed on food. But we have another problem, and it's very analogous, Andy, to your comments about what the pharmaceutical industry has done to our intake of drugs. Namely, you know, you're right. People say if if it's good for you, it tastes lousy. Well, frankly, partly that's because we've all been served terrible food called health food, and that doesn't need to be the case. But there is another problem. If you take an average commercial pasta sauce from a supermarket shelf in the United States, there's a very good chance that matched for calories it will have more added sugar than your typical chocolate ice cream topping. And if you pick an, I've actually done the math here. And if you pick an average breakfast cereal from one of the leading producers, it's very likely to have a higher concentration of sodium than either corn chips or potato chips. Now, if, you, if your taste buds are swimming in salt when you're not eating salty food and bathing in high fructose corn syrup when you're eating something that isn't even supposed to be sweet, if they get used to that and you eat wholesome food, it's going to taste weird to you. The good news that is, here, that I, is one of the biggest. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've corrupted and perverted our taste buds. The good, in my experience, taste buds are very malleable little fellas. <laughs> you know, when they can't be with the food they love, they learn to love the food they're with. We can get them with food <laughs> that they ought to be with, and, and people can act, you know, rehabilitate their palates, too. I think a, that's a very sad good. memory I have is of juicing uh, fresh orange juice for a family that we're visiting and giving a glass to this young boy who wouldn't drink it because he said it didn't taste like real orange juice. <laughs> it didn't taste like tang, no, right? Just, <laughs> you know, this is one of the things that we have to, to really accept and address because we have taste buds now amongst the general public in the United States that are completely attuned to over salt, sugar, fat, and the, with those three things, those are really, really deadening things that you can add to food. And if you are used to getting that sort of bam, bam, bam of those three things, once you start pulling that away and offering real flavor, 
people do back off from it because they don't know it's, what it's, that is. It's, it's not, not, it's not what it, they know. It, it hasn't been paved over. The flavor of the food hasn't been paved over. And any time that you have go through sort of processing food, you're always muting all of the flavors because the processing does that to it. So what do you do? You just boost fat and sugar and, and salt in it to just give it something. But that's all that most people know now is those three flavors. The, the, the good news from the science here is a number of clinical trials have shown if you get people to rehabilitate mm -hmm. their taste buds and acclimate to wholesome food, they, in fairly short order, consistently come to Very prefer short it. Order. Yeah, it, we, we can actually well, climb that hill. We just we need. I encourage to people because they say, "Well, what could I do to sort of figure out how how can I change the way that I eat?" And I always tell them, "Well, just do your grocery shopping then, just from the perimeter of the grocery store, because that'll keep you, of course, out of all of the aisles where the processed food or most of the processed food is. Of course, you have to make a couple of uh, exceptions in that. But if you do sort of focus on all of the exterior of the grocery store." store, most people have no idea then what to do with that stuff. They get past the lettuce and the apples, maybe some strawberries that they're going to just cut up, and then they say, well, then what would I eat? Because most of what they're eating is coming from the central part of the grocery store, and you actually have to know something about cooking in order to shop from the exterior of the grocery store. It's a, it's a real problem because that's most the problem people can't follow that. The problem with vegetables, you know, yeah. the people don't know yeah, how to cook vegetables; right. they don't that, know what to do. We've been real because our farmers market, the, our our Green City market, which is the organic farmers market here in Chicago, is has such interesting stuff. It, we call it the chef's market because it's where all the chefs go to shop. It it we have such cool stuff there, and yet many of the vendors can't sell the stuff because nobody knows what to do with it. So we started doing this sort of simple demos where we get a chef that comes in, and at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning and Saturday morning, the chef is going to take you walking through the, the market and say, I love this, here's one thing you can do with it. Here, I love this, here's one thing you can do with it, coming mm -hmm. back to a kitchen and actually making something simple out of a few of those things so that people can see how to incorporate them in. It's very simple, but it seems crazy hard if you don't know what so to do with I it. I want to get practical for a second about this. I um, was recently at a, an event where I won a case of dried Rancho Gordo heritage beans. <laughs> And it scared the heck out of my employees. They were like, what do you do? You have to soak them forever. Your life is going in, you know, forget the beans, throw them away. Do we get to hear how you won them? Well, I, I won them at a, a game called Edible Pursuit in San Francisco, where you go to a, um, a trivial pursuit about food. Mm. And, and uh, Dr. Wendy Kahatsu, who's going to be speaking there, was my partner, thank God, because she knew the answers. <laughs> <laughs> But I won the beans, and so I went, I went back to my staff, I said, I won this case of beans, and they were like, Wait, what would you possibly do with beans? I know that, that Andy, for you, and you know, David, you brought up our, us being uh, carnivore-oriented, mm. and beans and other grains are things that we really want to shift back to, but it's a thing people are afraid of. They, they look at them and think, what do I do with this thing? And so- well, Let me say a quick word there. Beans are cheap. They're right. very good protein sources, very good sources of fiber, uh, very good sources of low glycemic load carbohydrates, um, very good sources of other nutrients like folic acid. Uh, the main problem, also beans that, dried beans that you cook properly are delicious and much better than canned beans or bean products. Right. The main mistake that I see people make is they don't cook them long enough. Uh -huh. I get, and even in restaurants, I get served beans that are, you know, to me, beans are not supposed to be al dente. No. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> you know, and they are also not very easily digested when they're al dente. Exactly. You know, <laughs> so they, I like to until they're sort of melting into the liquid. Maybe that's why yeah. my employees were afraid of them. I'm sure yeah. that <laughs> must have been. That, that tends to be so, the fear. So, so, Rick, the question I have for you is what can you do with beans? Well, I, I'll tell you that my I, I always recommend this to everyone. I am a huge fan of a slow cooker. Yeah. And I think everybody should have a slow cooker because Great. there are a lot of a lot of dishes that you want to prepare, but you never have the time. Yep. So you just put them.